tourism agency, Visit Scotland, and a number of partners. And it aims to celebrate Scotland's outstanding contribu- contribution to everything from technology to textiles and ar- architecture to craft. The festival chairman, James Campbell, said that the uh, Union of in- Innovative Design and Traditional Whiskey Production, uh, Production was a fitting achievement to be celebrated during the themed year. He said, The five-day event offers a rare opportunity for whisky aficionados and beginners alike to learn more about the malts that make the region world famous. Now, this is a result of a successful marriage between traditional heritage and cutting-edge production. Now, Scotland's national tipple is the reason why thousands of visitors flock to the region for the 17th year of whisky festivals. These thousands of visitors will flock to the uh, festival which runs between April the 28th and May the 2nd and the five-day celebration races a toast to Speyside's internationally acclaimed malt whisky through extensive, exclusive tastings, tours and appreciations. The programme is made up of over 400 unique events including a selection of new attractions ensuring that there's something for everyone. For those who appreciate the region in equal measure to the whisky, the festival has organised a range of entertainment from comedy and crafting to cookery and indulgent dinners. And of course there's going to be heritage walks and scenic excursions. excursions. The first Scotland uh, theme year was in 2009 and is called the Year of the Homecoming. This success uh, brought a range of benefits to the country and boosted tourism overall. And following on from this, the government has announced, the Scottish government has announced a series of themed years to so- showcase the country as a dynamic and creative nation through a year, year-long periphery of programme and events. Of course, uh, Speyside contains more than half of all Scotland Walk Whisky distilleries, over 50 in total, and the vast majority of them will be staging events through the, through the festival, including many that are not normally open to the public. If you're interested and my boring monotonous tone hasn't put you off, you can find out more about the 2016 Spirit of Speyside Whiskey Festival at the website www.spiritofspayside.com where tickets will be on sale from early February. And the festival can also be found on facebook.com slash whiskey festival and Twitter and Instagram with the same handle at spirit underscore Speyside. You can follow me on Twitter at holiday underscore hut. I'm now going to run through a honeymoon checklist for you, a countdown as it is. I mean, your wedding day takes a lot of planning, but so does your honeymoon. Unfortunately, I've seen too many couples leave the honeymoon till the last minute and they end up with just a slightly more expensive version than they normally have on their annual trip. So here is how to count down for the perfect honeymoon. One year to go. Start planning. Where do you want to go? What weather conditions are you looking for? What do you want to do and see when you're there? Think about planning some a part-time too, and don't forget that compromise is very important in a new marriage. Decide if you're going to research and book yourself or use a professional. Set your price range. Uh, some companies have a wedding gift service where your guests can help pay towards your honeymoon. can come in very useful. And more, most importantly, don't forget to book the time off work. 11 to 6 months before your honeymoon. If you're not booking director online, find your travel professional. Choose wisely. A small independent travel agency will offer you the widest choice with flexible dates. And you'll probably deal with the same person throughout the booking process. But they may be a little bit more expensive. A large chain might be cheaper, but you'll end up with a limited choice. I've I've known this from my own mystery shopping. I go in knowing that there's a safari available for the dates I want to go. And the large travel company is trying to get me to go on their safari, which is two days too early. So you do have to be careful. A professional will know the special upgrades and deals for honeymoon couples. So it could actually work out a lot cheaper in the long run when compared to a DIY trip. And don't forget that about the wedding list option as well. See if they have that as available as an available option. Book as far in advance as possible to ensure that you get the trip you want. And there are only so many honeymoon suites and upgrades, so make sure that they all have your name on. And when you book, check all the paperwork carefully to make sure that the names are spelled correctly and you know when the balance has to be paid. 
don't make the mistakes uh, mistake of booking the bride under her new married name. Wait until after you've come back to change the passport. And of course, don't forget to sort out the travel insurance just in case you need to cancel for any reason. Five to three months keep up to date with travel training. news and leave me a message at facebook.com slash John Green Travel Show. Show. If you do this far in advance, aren't a problem, but forget these and do them last minute, then all your plans could go terribly wrong. And these checks are, well, check your passport. Does it have enough le life left in it? The usual requirement is six months left in the, the life of the, last, the uh, passport after the date of your return. If you need a replacement, visit www.gov.uk slash renew-adult-passport. And be very careful, there are websites on out there that will do help you to renew your passport and charge you a fee which you don't have to pay. You're basically being charged a fee to fill in what you would have to fill in if you went direct to the government website. Be very careful. What are the entry requirements for your destination? Do you need a visa? Do you need a minimum number of blank pages on your passport for the visa on arrival? I think in South Africa you need two blank pages, so you need to check that too. To find out what the entry requirements are, visit www.gov.uk slash FCO and search for your country of destination. And visit your GP or travel health clinic to arrange any necessary inoculations or malaria tablets. With a GP, some medication will be free. With a clinic, it's all probably going to be chargeable. But the opening hours are probably going to be more suitable for you. For a quick guide on what the, inf the medication you may need, you can just visit www.fitfortravel.nhs.uk but you should always double check with your GP or with the travel clinic. Two to one months before the big day. Check that all your bills will be paid when you're away. Sort of thing you should check anyway when you go away. Do you need any specialist equipment for your trip you need to buy, such as new snorkel or, or camera, hiking boots? Or perhaps you just need a whole new wardrobe? Have you arranged your transport to the hotel and your airport parking? Do you need to book any extras as a surprise for your partner? And don't forget you need to pay your balance for your trip in good time. Or if you've got it on a wedding list service, make sure that it's all been paid off. Two to three weeks before the big day. Inform your bank and credit card company that you'll be using your cards overseas. Order your currency. And check your medication. Do you need to start taking your tablets now? One week. Photocopy all your travel documents and leave a copy with friends or family and have another copy to carry with you. So this includes your travel insurance and the contact details, your passport, your flight tickets, the hotel vouchers, everything you need for your holiday. Make sure there's a copy with all the contact numbers which you can get easily. So either by having a spare copy with you or by contacting a family member or a friend. Six to three days, getting close now. Make sure you've charged <coughs> excuse me, make sure you've charged all your camera equipment, iPods, iPads, etc. Write a packing list, make sure everything you need is on that list and then pack. And check that you haven't overgone you gone haven't gone over your allowance for luggage. If you're on a safari, the little planes have a lot less allowance, so you need to pack for the lim the most the smallest of the amount of your whole trip. I think that made sense. And check your guest, your wedding guest list to see, to make sure you get a photograph to send to the right person. So if somebody's paid for you to go on a balloon trip on a safari, make sure you can get photographs and send them to the person who paid for it. And then one day they go, check in online as early as possible. Just make sure you get the best seats if you haven't been able to choose your seat already. And don't forget to relax and enjoy your trip. What about my phone call? I want to call my family. Too late now. Please, please, please. Step through now, please. Oh, no. Too late now. 
Here is the goods. You take them in false bottom bag, you strap them to your body, it's up to you. Look, I've, I've changed my mind. I want out. <laughs> Too late now. So, you're offering me a free holiday? Yeah. I just have to bring back something for a friend of yours. That's right. You'll get some serious cash. Right. Well? Um... Not too late. Don't get talked into trafficking drugs. Once you're in, the British government can't get you out. Don't throw your life away. Checking it out before you check in on the John Gwynn Travel Show on UKHealthRadio.com. Some airport and airline related news now. And a flight was delayed at Heathrow after a drone was flown over one of its runways. The departure runway was closed for seven minutes on uh, Saturday afternoon, uh, which I think I'm quite right by saying it was the second, and uh, because of safety concerns. Uh, domestic drones flown by hobbyists, hobbyists are an increasing concern to aircraft. I live at the end of a runway in uh, Bedfordshire, it's only a little airplane, uh, airfield, Cranfield, and I'd really like to have a drone, but it'd be completely irresponsible for me to have one because I'm so close. So, uh, People need to be more aware of what they're doing. And in, 2000, in 2014, December, a passenger plane had a near miss as a, with a drone when it landed at Heathrow. And in August last year, a drone was seen just 50 metres away from colliding with a passenger plane above London City Airport. Now, laws using drones, which can cost from £35 to many thousands, and mean they must not fly higher than 400 feet and must not be further than 500 metres away from a from the person operating it. But there must be some proper rules in there about airports and uh, flight paths. But uh, yes, it's lasers or drones at the moment. It's not good. A suspected rat sighting by a passenger meant that uh, an Air India flight was uh, delayed. The passenger spotted the uh, animal around three hours into the flight uh, to London from Mumbai. And the pilot returned to Mumbai, keeping passenger safety in mind. And the result, uh, this resulted in a delay of several hours for more than 200 passengers. The rodent was not spotted by crew, but the airline took no chances due to passenger concerns. It's not the first time something like this has happened. In July, a similar incident occurred when an Air India flight headed for Milan and turned back to Delhi after suspected a rat sighting. And now for another whoopsie, but far more serious. Uh, the South Korean Transport Ministry has ordered that a safety audit of all the country's low-cost carriers should take place after a Jin Air Boeing 737 took off with a door partially open. The flight turned back shortly after takeoff from Cebu in the Philippines en route to Busan after some of the 163 passengers complained of loud noise and headaches. The Transport Ministry in a statement said all low-cost ha- carriers will undergo an overall inspection of their safety management to prevent similar accidents. It seems that the noise was caused by wind coming through a small gap in the door which had not been closed properly. An alarm signalled a problem with air pressure so we decided to uh, return to Cebu, said uh, the Jin Air spokesperson. The Transport Ministry added that we will investigate the maintenance and operation records of the plane and if any regulations were violated, we will fine the airline. Uh, Jin Air is a low-cost affiliate of major carrier Korean Air. Low-cost means things like Ryanair, EasyJet, that sort of thing, but it's very difficult now to tell the difference between a low-cost airline and a mainstream one. But there we go. And uh, something about Aruba now, for some of you who are thinking of going to that country, I have had it on the show a couple of times. And uh, basically it's a frequent complaint at many airports, there's no Wi-Fi, free or otherwise. I mean, Luton Airport does free half hour, but just the once, and when you're a regular visitor, you can't use it again. Or well, that's what's happened to me and my friends anyway. But Aruba is looking into this sort of thing, and it's the latest airport in the Caribbean to add free Wi-Fi. Aruba's International Airport has officially launched the free Wi-Fi for airport users and passengers. And it means that passengers can now surf the internet, social media and communicate with friends and loved ones while waiting for their flights. This is the latest digital innovation at the island's airport. Uh, Aruba recently became the first Caribbean island to offer digital embarkation and customs cards for incoming travellers. 
So I've already mentioned at the beginning of the show that the Christmas period makes life confusing, but there's always one certainty when it's the new year. People come out with loads of reports about the previous year, 